Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on real-time cryo-EM analysis for all. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar is approximately 50 minutes in length with time for questions at the end. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom application. The recording of today's webinar will be made available and will be shared with everyone who registered. For more resources in the meantime, please feel free to visit cryospark.com live. Today, we're going to cover use cases for real-time processing in single particle cryo-EM, CryoSpark Live software architecture and capabilities, a demo walking through the live interface and how processing actually works, real life examples from our guest speakers in industry and academia, and finally question and answer. And again, we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Today's webinar will be presented by Ali Punjani, Sohel Dawood, Stefan Arl Dawson, and myself, Sara Virani from Structura Biotechnology. We're really excited to be speaking to you on behalf of ourselves and the rest of the team who supports the development of CryoSpark and CryoSpark Live. Structura Bio is a Toronto-based startup and a leading provider of scientific software solutions for single particle cryo-EM in life science and drug discovery. We aim to combine computational methods advancements with modern software engineering to build products that empower cryo-EM research. We're also very pleased to be joined today by experts from the field of cryo-EM, Giovanna Scapin and Craig Yoshioka. Giovanna's background in structural biology and cryo-EM for drug discovery is extensive. She joined Merck in 1997, where she was involved in several drug discovery projects, providing structural biology support for diabetes, inflammation, and oncology targets. After spending 18 months as an embedded scientist at the New York Structural Biology Center to learn hands-on cryo-EM, Giovanna went back to Merck full-time in 2018, where she established a new cryo-EM facility. In March 2020, she joined Nano Imaging Services as chief scientist of the newly established NIS East Client Center in Woburn, Massachusetts. We're also joined by Craig Yoshioka. Craig has been involved in cryo-EM research for over 15 years since starting graduate school at the Scripps Research Institute in the gr group of Bridget Carragher and Clint Potter. Over the years, he's been involved in several cryo-EM research projects, software development of new automation and processing tools, and designing and administering IT infrastructure for microscopy installations. Since 2018, he's been co-director of the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center, an NIH-funded national facility that currently serves over 400 users across more than 160 active two-year projects. Thank you to Giovanna and Craig for joining us today. Now I'll turn it over to Ali to get us started. Thanks, Sara. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. As everyone here has probably seen, single particle cryo-EM has gone from a niche technique just a few years ago to one of the dominant and fastest growing techniques in structural biology today. New high resolution structures of interesting biomolecules and drug targets are being solved on a daily basis. And there's a strong push to train new scientists in the field around the world. On top of that, equipment is being procured and set up at an accelerating pace globally. The growth we're seeing in cryo-EM now is only the beginning. Usage is increasing exponentially and cryo-EM is expected to become as large or even larger than X-ray crystallography in terms of annual public structure depositions in the coming years. During that growth phase and beyond, the new frontiers of structural biology that cryo enables will also be explored further and will add even more to this explosion of new discoveries. With more data being collected at faster and faster rates, there's also a sharp increase in the amount and complexity of data processing tasks that need to be carried out. Direct electron cameras and microscopes are getting faster and cheaper all the time, and typical throughput is already in the several hundred images per hour range. Dataset sizes are also growing larger as the complexity and scope of projects increase. In this environment, the, as the ambition and scope of cryo-EM are increasing, access to microscopes, structured turnaround time, and the quality of results of, that can be achieved remain critical. As many of us have probably experienced firsthand, cryo-EM samples do not always behave as expected, and optimizing a sample for collection can be a challenging task. And in fact, there are many more samples being prepared today than time available on microscopes. Many people in the field have pointed to real-time processing as a way to, first of all, optimize data collection and sample selection to achieve better results by enabling decision-making on the fly. For example, that might take the form of selecting between different grids and squares, optimizing microscope optics or data collection parameters. 
Second, real-time processing is seen as a way to optimize the use of microscope time generally so that poor samples can get dropped early and good samples have lots of data collected. And third, real-time processing can massively accelerate the time it takes to actually get to a high resolution refined structure. And this is increasingly important in drug discovery contexts. There have been several projects working to develop real-time pre-processing of cryovium data as an initial source of feedback. But the real power of real-time processing is when 2D and 3D reconstruction can drive the feedback loop, making the goal of optimizing data collection actually attainable, hopefully. This is what we are super excited to be presenting about today. Um, through our efforts in building a powerful software system, CryoSpark and CryoSpark Live, we're trying to make real-time processing a major change that improves everyone's cryovium results. On that note, Sara will talk us through some of the use cases for real-time processing. Thanks, Ali. So when thinking about designing a solution for real-time cryoEM processing, it's important to remember that the landscape is quite varied when it comes to user and facility types. And so are the needs and the value that they then correspondingly gain from a real-time solution. If you're a data collection facility who supports dozens or hundreds of users, you'd ideally want rapid visual feedback about the sample as soon as possible into a collection. That can tell you more about sample quality, preferred orientation, and ultimately an idea of how successful the 3D reconstruction process might be. You probably need or want to communicate this information back to the end user who submitted the sample so they can figure out next steps for their project, like going back to optimize sample preparation. If you're a microscope operator in, in industry, sorry, in general, but also in industry, you know that microscope time is very valuable. So being able to make a go or no go decision on a sample allows for prioritizing projects and getting through as many good samples as possible. You might also want to take the diagnostic information and initial 3D reconstruction and use that to make decisions about changing data collection parameters like tilt or defocus for future runs. If you're a CRO or a service provider, the ability to provide your clients with quick updates about whether sample preparation was successful and the presence or absence of expected ligands or even delivering an initial 3D map can help to actually validate your process and help the client to make internal decisions about the project at their end. And finally, if you're an individual user, your data processing workflow will likely be quite iterative before you get a final 3D map. So being able to use an initial streamlined workflow that consists of common steps and the ability to experiment with parameter choices can hopefully save a lot of time overall. For example, the results of real-time pre-processing, 2D classes, or an initial 3D structure from the live workflow can be used directly for advanced processing in CryoSpark or other programs. And at the very least, real-time processing allows for quickly trying out different strategies up front, so you can settle on something that will hopefully work really well for the project or data set that you're currently tackling. That last point I think is particularly important. Ideally, you'd want to be able to use a streamlined workflow for data processing, not just on data that's newly streaming in from, micro from a microscope, but also on data that you've already collected in full. So what is CryoSpark Live? In a nutshell, CryoSpark Live is a platform for decision-making based on 2D and 3D results during cryoEM data collection but it's also engineered as an expedited workflow for processing data that has been previously collected. Live is comprised of three major stages. The first is rapid scalable pre-processing, as well as the ability to experiment with parameter changes and thresholding and propagate those across existing and incoming images. The second stage in Live is streaming 2D classification, which classifies particles continuously as more become available from upstream steps. And finally, the third stage is streaming 3D reconstruction and refinement, which allows for intermediate reconstructions to be created very early on into a collection based on the particles that are then available. These then visually update as the session progresses, and if the data quality is sufficient, you can often reach very high resolutions directly in the live workflow. We started working on CryoSpark Live initially in January 2019 and released the first version in a private beta in May of that year. And we'd like to say a huge thank you to the many labs and users that took the time to test out live and provide their feedback. Over the course of the beta, we released 11 additional updates to live. And in December 2020, we launched a fully redesigned application, taking into account the extensive feedback that we received. CryoSpark Live was quite a large engineering undertaking, so we're very proud to be able to deliver it free of charge for nonprofit academic use. 
For academic users, access to CryoSpark Live is enabled by default as of CryoSpark version 3.0. So you can already start to use it for live and non-live processing. And finally, I also want to mention that just like with CryoSpark, by no means is the development of CryoSpark Live over. Our team is continuously working to build improvements and enable more advanced workflows. I'll now turn it over to Sohil to walk us through the software architecture and current capabilities. Thanks, Sarah. In order to make real-time processing a reality, our team engineered a solution that breaks away from the traditional CryoEM data processing workflow that you may be familiar with. Traditionally, cryo-EM data processing involves many iterations of pre-processing, exposure creation, picking, 2D classification, and finally, reconstruction and refinement from a subset of high-quality particles. Although these individual steps have gotten much faster and resource efficient over time, manual intervention is always needed to experiment with parameters and interact with tools that allow for selecting the highest quality results from each step. This iterative workflow is further complicated when new raw data is introduced into a project. The new data requires separate steps for curation, and any classification or reconstruction jobs have to be restarted to take into account the newly classified particles. With CryoSpark Live, we've built an interactive and intuitive way to explore and curate data in real time with the goal of attaining a high resolution structure as quickly as possible. This real-time processing paradigm is centered around a linear workflow, which condenses the traditional data processing pipeline into just a few steps. Together, this forms what we call a live session. Every session processes exposures, which are raw movies from an ongoing or completed microscope collection session. I'll walk through some of the engineering challenges around designing a real-time processing system and explain the solutions we've developed into CryoSpark Live. Traditional data processing operates under the assumption that data sets are fixed in size. CryoSpark Live is designed around the concept of streaming data, which means live sessions will automatically process any new exposures it finds. Rather being limited to a single group of data to process, you can define any number of what we call exposure groups, which can represent different sources of data, such as exposure separated by grid number or beam tilt location. In CryoSpark Live, all pre-processing steps that you typically do on a set of data is done all in one step on single exposures and at high speed. This job type called a live worker includes motion correction, CTF estimation, preview generation, particle picking, and particle extraction. This fundamental component to CryoSpark Live enables a much more interactive workflow, as you can easily come back to any previously processed exposure and read to one or more stages of pre-processing. Additionally, live workers can scale depending on the resources you have available, and you can modify the number of GPUs allocated for the pre-processing step over the course of the session lifecycle. On a four GPU workstation, we typically dedicate two GPUs for pre-processing, which can easily handle over 1000 exposures per hour from data collected on a Catan K2 camera. Another key component to the CryoEM processing pipeline is exposure creation. The ability to filter out poor quality exposures from further processing steps is critical to optimize processing and also attain a high resolution structure. Usually curating data sets is quite tedious and is done after data has been collected. Instead, in CryoSpark Live, we've designed an interactive curation tool that allows you to set thresholds and apply them to all exposures in the session. You can filter based on many exposure attributes that are computed, such as the amount of motion, CTF quality, ice thickness, and number of particle picks. These thresholds also apply to new exposures that are being processed, ensuring that the standard of quality that you define is carried throughout the entire data collection session. Particle picking is the next major step in the processing pipeline, and it is considered a fine art to optimize. Picking a healthy selection of high quality particle picks typically requires a lot of iteration as you experiment with different picker types, particle diameters, and threshold picks based on their score. We've made particle picking and curation in CryoSpark Live fully interactive, making it easy to optimize the picking strategy over the course of your data collection session. With a single click, you can test adjustments to picking parameters and thresholds and see how they'll change without already losing extracted picks. All changes appear in real time on the exposure viewer. When you're ready to apply new picking settings to your session, CryoSpark Live will re-pick and re-extract particles from exposures without having to do, redo other pre-processing steps. 2D classification is a critical step in the CryoEM processing pipeline. It is a key indicator of the quality of your data set and can bucket particles based on view and confirmation. Traditionally, 2D classification processes data with the assumption that all particles are available in every iteration. This means that if you would like to reclassify new particles, the 2D classification job needs to be restarted. 
we've developed streaming 2D classification specifically for CRISPR Clive, and it breaks that assumption by being able to classify new particles without having to restart the job. Just like all steps in, the, in CRISPR Clive, you can easily stop and restart this process, changing parameters like the number of classes along the way, all without stopping the session. 2D classes provide some insight, but to really understand your sample, a 3D reconstruction is needed. In CRISPR Live, the final stages of the real-time pipeline are ab initio model generation and homogeneous refinement, allowing for high resolution structure determination while data collection is in progress. This makes it easier to understand diagnostics such as orientation distribution of particles and visually inspect structural details through the integrated volume viewer. And just like streaming 2D classification, streaming refinement is designed to be reactive to upstream changes in particle selections. As we saw, CRISPR Live is specifically designed for this focused linear workflow from raw data to 3D structure. However, there are still many cases where advanced processing is required to learn more about your target and extract the highest quality structure from the data available. For this reason, we've developed CRISPR Live to integrate seamlessly with the main CRISPR application meaning all the data that you process in CRISPR Live is available to continue processing. So you can kick off a non-uniform refinement, CTF refinement, and 3D variability analysis directly from the live results. Along with enabling this real-time paradigm shift, we've put a great deal of effort into engineering, um, into helping you be more productive and spend less time configuring data and processing. Traditionally, cryo-EM data processing requires creating jobs step-by-step and requiring queuing them manually based on the compute resources that are available at that time. In CRISPR Live, the configuration tab is a single place to configure a session before running it. There's even a helpful start checklist that reminds you of the few required parameters that are needed in order to, be, to begin processing. After beginning a session, you can pause it at any time and resume it later on without losing any of your progress. And when you're ready to start a new session, you can use a saved configuration profile from a previous session to automatically apply any new parameters that you would like to reuse. The best way to truly understand how powerful CRISPR Live can be is to see it in practice. And for that, I'll turn it over to Stefan, who has prepared a demo for us. Hey everyone, my name is Stefan Arnold Thaston, and I'm one of the software engineers behind CRISPR Live. For the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be walking you through a demo processing a real data set in CRISPR Live. This isn't a live demo, of course, because we're limited by webinar time constraints, but check out the on-screen timer to get a sense of how long this 2800 movie data set actually took. As mentioned, you can use CrySpark Live to process movies as they're captured by a microscope during a data collection session, or for users who don't have access to a microscope in-house, you can process all your data in one go and obtain a first cut reconstruction in a streamlined workflow. This allows you to get a glimpse into your 3D reconstruction very early on. Let's get started. When you first open up CRISPR Live, you'll be greeted with the Browse Sessions page. Here, you can navigate to all past and current sessions, see statistics, view running jobs, and start new sessions. I'm going to create a new session to process our data set. I'll be processing Empire 10288. This GPCR was collected using a Thermo Fisher Scientific Titan Creos and a Gatan K2 Summit Direct Electron Camera. The dataset is about 500 gigabytes with almost 2,800 movies with 40 frames each in the TIFF format. When you first open a new live session, you'll be taken to the configuration tab. There are a total of nine tabs, which you can access using the left navigation bar. On the details tab, I can see general information, history, and notes about the session. Navigating to the configuration tab, this is where I will input all the parameters for my dataset and set the hardware resources that this live session will use. I need to tell CRISPR Live where to find the movies and gain reference for this data set. I'll hit enable, and once the session starts, CRISPR Live will constantly check for new movies that show up in the folder and select ones that match the wildcard filter. I only need these seven parameters to get the CRISPR Live session running, but since I've processed a similar data set before, I'll use a configuration profile to auto-load the parameters we need. You can use profiles to speed up routine session setup to a couple of clicks. When selecting hardware resources, a minimum of three GPUs is required for CRISPR Live, one for pre-processing and two for reconstruction. However, we recommend four GPUs, so you can have two pre-processing workers to speed up processing time. I'll spawn two pre-processing workers for the session. Now that all the required parameters have been set, I can start the session to start processing. When the session starts, the two pre-processing workers will be spawned, and they'll immediately start processing the movies that were found in the folder I specified. These pre-processing workers complete motion correction, CTF estimation, particle picking, and particle extraction for each movie very quickly. 
As exposures are processed, you'll see their status and their thumbnail at the top in the exposure feed. You can also use the individual tab to follow each exposure as it's processed. Motion correction and CTF plots are shown on the left, and the actual exposure and the current pick locations are shown on the right. The exposure viewer allows you to zoom in on the exposure, set a low pass filter to more easily see particles, and even manually pick particles right on the micrograph. In the overview tab, you can inspect all computed attributes of your exposures and set thresholds that will include or exclude the particles from these exposures in further processing steps like streaming 2D classification and streaming refinement. As exposures are processed, CrySpark Live will check if their attributes fall within these ranges and automatically reject or accept them. You can also reject an exposure manually in the Exposure Viewer. The Browse tab allows you to plot different attributes against each other and download filtered attributes as a CSV file. This table is also helpful for navigating to specific exposures. The Picking tab is where you will perfect your particle picks by setting parameters and dialing in picking thresholds. By default, CrySpark Live will pick particles on your exposures using the Blot Picker, which uses several different sized Gaussian shaped masses as templates. For some datasets, this may be good enough, but for most, you can 2D classify these initial blob picks to create a few effective templates that can be used to repick particles across your entire dataset. You can repick particles at any time during the data processing session, as it doesn't take much time. But to save even more time, you could test your particle picking settings using the Test Adjustments button on a single exposure. I can select a few classes to use as templates for the template picker. I'm going to set a particle diameter and hit Test Adjustments to see these settings on the current exposure. The exposures will be processed almost instantly, and I'll be able to see how my new settings compare to the original settings. Once I'm happy with my settings, I can instruct CryoSpark Live to repick particles across the entire dataset by hitting Activate for All. This is a great example of what makes CryoSpark Live so powerful. You can instantly react to changes in your data collection session and try out different parameter combinations since CryoSpark will only redo the processing that is required to affect the desired result. If you noticed, when I hit Activate for All, every exposure reverted to picking status. That's because since we only changed the picker type, there's no need to redo motion correction or CTF estimation. This auto reprocessing feature is triggered whenever any parameter in CryoSpark Live is changed so the processing workflow remains efficient. Now that I'm happy with the templates used to pick particles, I can modify the NCC and power scores using the sliders to filter out unwanted particles that will eventually go into streaming 2D classification. As I change sliders, the pick locations are updated in the exposure viewer. I can flip through different exposures to see how my thresholds affect particles in micrographs at different defocus levels. Once I apply these thresholds, all existing and new particles will be thresholded. Now that I've dialed in my picking parameters, I can start my streaming 2D classification job. As new particles are extracted and thresholded by the CrySpark Live workers, the streaming 2D classification job will align and classify them. When we first start the job, it will create the initial class averages by quickly processing only a subset of the particles. One thing to note is that all jobs that run in CrySpark Live are regular CrySpark jobs. You can always flip into the main CrySpark interface, navigate to your session, and view your jobs there. Now that the streaming 2D classification job has finished creating all the initial class averages, we can select all the good classes and all particles that belong to each of these classes will continue on to the next stages of processing. At any point, I can modify my class selection to tune which particles move on to streaming refinement. All particle processing jobs will react to any additions or removal of particles and deal with them appropriately. For example, if you modify the picking thresholds to be more stringent, which reduces the number of particles that are accepted, if there are enough particles removed, the streaming 2D classification job would switch to a mode where it recreates the class averages that it aligns incoming particles to. This allows the class averages to stay relevant and help you react to any changes in your data collection session. Before we can start a streaming refinement job, we need an initial model. We can either start an ab initio reconstruction job here to create one, or we can load an existing model. I'll go ahead and start a new one, since it doesn't take much time. The final step of initializing our end-to-end -end CrySpark Live real-time processing session is to start the streaming refinement job. This job will use the initial model to refine and reconstruct a high-resolution structure with incoming particles and will update as more particles are extracted from incoming exposures. 
I can either start the job using the parameters exposed here, or if there are more advanced parameters I want to set, I can hit build with custom parameters. This will create a job in the main CrySpark interface where you can use the job builder to modify any parameters. When the streaming homogeneous refinement starts, it will take all the available particles up until that point and refine them against the initial model until convergence. At that point, the refinement job will stream in any new particles by backtracking the model to 70% of the last output resolution and start another round of high resolution refinement until convergence. This process repeats as more particles are added. As processing iterations are completed, we'll see the plots updated on the left and the 3D model that was created on the right. The 3D model viewer is a handy tool that you can use to instantly inspect your structure as particles are being processed. You can rotate the model, set a threshold, and even download it for further inspection in a tool like UCSF Chimera. At this point, I can leave my CrySpark Live session running until all my movies are finished processing. Exposures will be pre-processed by the CrySpark Live workers and accepted based on my CTF fit threshold. Then, particles that are picked by the template picker will be filtered by my NCC and power thresholds. Then, extracted particles will be 2D classified and filtered based on my selected class averages, and finally, reconstructed in a high resolution structure, all without any input automatically. If at any point I notice that data processing is not going in the direction I want it to, I can always change any of these parameters, and the reprocessing system in CrySpark Live will take care of redoing only the work that needs to be done, and nothing more, allowing me to iterate very quickly, all before my data collection even finishes. Once all my movies have completed processing, I can mark the session as complete. At any time, I can take the results that have been created by CrySpark Live and further process them in the main CrySpark interface. I can use the outputs directly from streaming 2D classification or streaming refinement to continue processing. I can also get all the exposures and particles that were processed in this session directly into my workspace by using the export actions. This concludes a typical data processing session in CrySpark Live. Hopefully, you got a glimpse of how easy it is to extract powerful insights from your data in such a short period of time. Great. Now that we've seen what uh, CrySpark Live is about, let's see how it's being used. We're going to turn it over to Giovanna to talk to us about the industry use case for real-time processing. Giovanna, you're mute. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm really glad to uh, be part of this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Giovanni Scapin. I am the chief scientist at the Wobon site of a company that's called Nanoimaging Services. And uh, uh, what we do in this company is basically uh, try to enable every process uh, of drug discovery through CryoEM. Um, we help uh, um, researchers of pharmaceutical biotechnology companies to move into CryoEM. And uh, we try to bring the power of CryoEM to every step on the development of a new drugs. Uh, and uh, we try to do it uh, in, uh, in a very uh, informative way with our clients. We um, look at every step and we look at many different aspects of drug discovery from uh, antibody development all the way to high structure uh, solution and uh, uh, refinement. Um, I want to give a little bit of introduction of cryo -EM drug discovery because this has been my uh, bread and butter for the past maybe five years or so. As uh, Sarah mentioned at the beginning, I, my background is as a structural biologist and I have been a structural biologist for all my life. And uh, my passion in life is to actually apply uh, structural biology any kind of structural biology to the development of new, of new drugs. And I was lucky enough to be able to do it for many years working for a big pharmaceutical company and lucky to continue doing it now while I work for nanoimaging services. So um, the development of a new drug takes many years, so we know that, and many, many different steps. And I summarized them very shortly and briefly in, in this arrow up there. And uh, uh, I talked very often of the contribution that uh, structural biology can give to a drug discovery effort. And most of these contributions are 
at the very beginning of the drug discovery, when we talk about target identification, hit identification, and lead optimization. Um, now, in the past, I think, few years, we have seen many, many examples that prove how much cryoEM has contributed to the early stages of drug discovery and how much of the conformational and size space has uh, uh, cryoEM brought to life, uh, giving us access to structures that a few years ago were completely uh, unthinkable. In, in not just of membrane proteins uh, or uh, larger assemblies, but also things in motion, uh, molecular machines, so things that uh, move in order to, to carry out their own functions, and we are now able to see them. So the role of cryoEM at the very early stages of uh, uh, drug discovery, so structure target identification when we want actually understand the biology of the uh, system and understanding initial binding modes is clearly established. There is really not too much that we can say or do about it. What we wanna do now is to move in this third step, which is the lead optimization. And it's more of a, a medicinal chemistry uh, realm at the moment, right? So we want to be able to prov provide structural support using cryo-EM for a real uh, structure-based drug design. And what is required in this step of the drug development is uh, uh, the capability of providing structures at high resolution with a very high throughput and with a good timing. The resolution I'm not even gonna talk about because we know how important it is if we want to see atoms and ligands and bonds, so we need to be a high resolution, but we are moving there with cryo-EM more and more often. Uh, I wanna just make a little comment about timing and throughput that basically uh, ties back to the fact that, uh, cryo, that uh, uh, CryoSpark Live provides a big support in this development. Why do we need to be fast? And why no, do we need to be reliable? And also most importantly, we need to be very early and very proactive in the process. Because if we want to include the structural and modeling information into this cycle that I, I identify on the left, which is basically a drug uh, development cycle in which we form some hypothesis about a ligand, we design these new molecules, chemistry synthesize the molecules, and then biology assay, assays and defines the activity of all these molecules, we need to be really fast because chemistry and biology move really fast when we are in the range of drug discovery. And so if you wanna be part of this cycle, we need basically to keep up with the speed in which these molecules are designed, tested, synthesized, synthesized, tested, and then we want to provide real time uh, information and inform the further hypothesis and further design. Crystallography is really fast. It's still much, much, much faster than cryoEM. If you have a system in place, you can get several structures a week. Cryoem is still quite slow. It's not quite there yet. Even if you have a system in place, it's so much dependent on sample preparation, grid preparation, and a lot of other uh, uh, factors that we can still get maybe a structure a week, maybe a couple of structures a week, but it's definitely not sufficient to be consi consistently active in the structure-based drug design cycle. Why, why is not like that? Why it's still slow? So as I mentioned, there are different things, right? So there is a whole upstream process of sample preparation, optimization of the sample quality, grid preparation, optimization of the grid and everything else that it's I'm widely discussed in many other forums and I will not touch it upon here. But one thing that I'm gonna touch here, upon here is the accelerating the process of uh, uh, data collection, uh, data interpretation and uh, uh, generating a map. So this is actually a pretty old slide that I had done maybe pretty old, three years ago, in which I was asking for automation. Automation in the, uh, in the um, processing world because human interventions, as I pointed out, were still very much required for particle picking, selecting the 2D classes, go back and recalculate the 2D classes, 
selecting the particles again, evaluation of, of the heterogeneity, or evaluation of the 3D model and everything else. The pre-processing part, so all the way up to CTF calculation, was actually somewhat automated. There were a couple, there are a couple of uh, uh, systems that do that all together. But then when we got to the point of particle picking, we are stuck of doing it by hand. And since you will do it once and be done, you will have to wait until the end of the data collection, which could be two days, three days. And so everything got slowed down a lot. That's why uh, Cryosp CryoSpark Live really to us in drug discovery made a big impact because now we have everything automated, right? And we can basically go from uh, data collection to map calculation very fast and most importantly, hands off, which means that we can start the data collection on the microscope, we start the cryo, uh, CryoSpark and then we go on and do other things and without having to worry about keeping on, on touching and, and generating different images and, and different 2D classes. And I just wanna give you a very brief example of how we use CryoSpark Live in, in my company. Our mantra is uh, a CryoSpark Live for every autoloader uh, microscope that we have. And at this point, uh, we, we have four, maybe uh, soon to be five. And so we have CryoSpark Live running every time we do a data collection on one of these microscopes. Um, we have two classes of microscopes, uh, Glacius and the Cryos. And CryoSpark is widely used in all the scopes with slightly different flavors. So for the Glacius, which is what I mostly use in our uh, facility here in Woburn, uh, we do a lot of negative staining, interestingly enough. And we use uh, CryoSpark Live to provide a real-time analysis of the samples, so from grid preparation all the way to 2D classification in about three hours. And so we can go through many different samples uh, in a day, and mostly we can provide our clients with real information about the status, the quality, the type of the samples that are not easily uh, um, extractable just by the micrographs. We do a lot of uh, um, Preliminary work for vitrification, we see a lot of very difficult samples that uh, are seeing cryo EM for the first time. And so there is a lot of screening that we need to do for optimal condition. And using the CryoSpark Live, we can again uh, run in parallel with an overnight data collection. And by the end of the data collection, understanding really the sample quality, if there is an issue of preferred orientation. And we can again, provide the client with a much better characterization of the grid preparation of the quality of the grids or the vitrification system that we have uh, uh, utilized to make those specific grids. At the, in uh, San Diego, where we have our cryos farm, we use CryoSpark Live for, uh, again, different uh, uh, goals. If we have a very good sample that we know it's good, we do what was basically shown in the movie. We started in parallel with uh, uh, the data collection and uh, we get to a full 3D map in 24 to 48 hours, which is not several structures a week, but we are getting there because if every sample behaves well, we can actually do that. Uh, the other good thing, as I mentioned before, is that we can stop the data collection if we realize that the ice is too thick, the classes are not good. Uh, all information that we can't get just by looking at the, at the micrograph as they came across. And that saves a lot of time because we can either switch to another grid or just stop the data collection and save the client money, basically. For samples that are suboptimal, uh, we, we use CryoSpark to evaluation of the sample as the data comes in again. And uh, it, as before, we can stop the data collection or change to other grids or propose other a solution to the to the client or on internally decide how to move. And with that, I hope I gave you a good overview of what we do and why we use CryoSpark Live. And I'll get back to, uh, I think, uh, Ali, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Giovanna. That was really, really insightful. And it's amazing to see just how much of an impact real-time processing can have in fast turnaround and decision-making in that, in that industry context. That's really awesome for us to see as well. Great. Um, next, we'd like to ask Craig to share his experiences at uh, what it's like running a large academic facility and using real-time processing there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, you can hear me okay? 
Yeah, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we use um, CrowdSpark Live at the Pacific Northwest CryoEM Center. I'm Craig Yoshoka. I'm one of the corrector, uh, co-directors of the Pacific Northwest CryoEM Center, or PNCC for short. We're in Portland, Oregon. We're one of three um, NIH-funded national cryoEM centers. The other ones are NCCAT in New York and STC2 in San Francisco. And we're here to provide free access to instrumentation and training uh, in CryoEM to the as long as your projects are public science, science that you want to publish um, papers. So a really quick overview of the center itself. We have five microscopes with an extra a glacius that we have access to. I'd like to note that when the center got started in 2018, um, each of these cryoses collected about maybe uh, was around 200 images per hour. And since then we've gotten up to an average around four to 500 and sometimes even up to 900 images per hour. So I th often think that when we were applying for this grant in 2017, we asked for three cryoses and now we have essentially nine to 12 cryoses worth of cap capability by those standards. And that really gets to the point of the importance of latency and processing speed um, when you're work doing this kind of work. We have at PNCC, we have resources for users to process their data, you know, traditional batch processing. Um, since our resource is a collaboration between Oregon Health and Sciences University and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. And we currently have had approved around over 200 projects. I think 160-ish are active with 400 plus users. And then we have some on-site sample preparation capabilities. So really what makes the center run is our, um, our team. We have a bunch of what we call SPOCs or scientific points of contacts, which are in the red box there. Um, they're the group that are making the microscopes collect data and training users and doing a lot of the processing. So when I think about processing at PNCC, since we are a multi-institution um, facility, it's this diagram is a little bit complicated, but the data has to move several stages. Primarily though, what I'm talking about today is focused on this area on the, on the left. So our microscopes all write their data directly to a central uh, network storage solution. And this is where all the live processing happens. And I'm often asked about how we do processing at PNCC. And my answer is almost always, we only ever have time to run CryoSpark live. Like as soon as, as um, a sample goes off the microscope and the next sample goes on the microscope, we have to free up all the resources that were being used to process that to jump to the, to the next sample. We've been making do with five microscopes with 16 GPUs. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that over the last year, year, year plus, it's been impossible to buy GPUs essentially. And so we were not able to get our full complement, but we just recently um, acquired that. So we will be able to run live on every single microscope collecting data we currently sometimes have to make some choices about which uh, runs we continue and which ones we don't. But the goal is to, to have CryoSpark Live running for every microscope, for every sample on the microscope. So there's been already a lot of demonstrations of the various um, uses for CryoSpark Live by multiple speakers. Uh, our use at PNCC is no different. We use CrowdSpark Live to like tune data collection, optimize parameters. Um, when you first get, get a run going, data collection run going, you watch the pre-processing steps a lot, things like CTF bit resolutions, motion trajectories to try and optimize the number of frames, the total dose and so forth. Uh, many times you will monitor these same parameters during data collection to make sure that the microscope itself is still performing well or that the ice, the areas you've targets you've selected are of reasonable quality. But really to close the loop in data collection, you go all, ideally you go all the way through 2D classification and 3D refinement. And that's really like our end goal for any run is to have hopefully have a sample that could get all the way through 3D refinement 
And so we can really start to get a feeling for how the data processes. In many cases, you can get a really good answer directly after, you know, when you stop the microscope, you have hopefully a nice 3D structure. But even in the cases that don't work out, you get a lot more information about what should be tried next, what might be needed by the user during processing um, to extract optimal more data, and whether or not the project um, is, is could go back to sample preparation or should just uh, persevere and sort of uh, try more advanced processing approaches later on. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of, of runs that we've had. And I just kind of picked these semi-randomly out of the last two weeks of runs that we've had because um, they're they look pretty nice examples. They're all C1. You've already gotten an overview of the entire user interface, but just to recapitulate, let me uh, minimize some of these windows. The blocking. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, just to recapitulate, you we for example, we used a lot of these pre-processing diagnostics to tune data collection and monitor. You have here the motion trajectories, the global motion trajectories. You often see very large jumps in the first initial couple of frames. It's just part of life. Ideally, you want to make those jumps as small as possible to extract the most, uh, the highest resolution data when the sample is before the sample is damaged by a lot of um, dose. But uh, you can't always, it's a compromise in a lot of cases, right? So this is where the tuning of, of data collection comes in. Uh, uh, one thing I really loved about CryoSpark Live is that right off the bat, when we started using it in 2019, it included local motion trajectories. So you can get a real feel for how variable, how much um, uh, area-based variability there is in the motion trajectories. This is a pretty decent image, actually. Uh, another very popular metric to measure is the PCF fit resolution. This is... Um, will vary by sample by sample. So there's no hard and fast rules, but what we want to do is to try and push this number as high as possible, the CTF fit resolution as high as possible for any given sample and sort of monitor the sample going on to make sure that those, those values stay in a, in a reasonable range. Uh, another thing I really, really loved when I started using CrossSpark Live was the patch-based CTF estimation, because that really lets you see sort of the topography of the area and if there's any challenges with the sample uh, not being perfectly flat. I've all, this is something that's long been a hypothesis that a lot of the beam-induced motion might be exacerbated by um, samples being uh, not just a tilt, but mechanically not flat, so that when they start getting hit by the beam, they start um, moving around a lot more. So this is a really uh, nice diagnostic to have too. And then getting into the monitoring and the overview, which was also shown, once you've started a run going long enough, you, you can establish real nice patterns and hopefully you see a uh, very consistent sort of uh, behavior in your data set. You have the defocus ranges here. You can actually see the defocus ramps by um, exposure groups. Uh, max frame motion is a little bit high on this data set, but again, that's sometimes just a compromise you have to make. And then you can see here, another favorite of ours is the CTF fit, and you see some outliers out here, which are presumably probably like um, just bad images, and you can quickly threshold and remove those if you want to from your data set. So that's very useful. And at the end of the day, um, I've skipped over the 2D classification in this case, but what you hope to see is a, is a nice 3D map with nice angular coverage. This one's particularly nice, actually, and even. Uh, and you have right off the bat, uh, when we stop this data collection, a uh, sub three angstrom map of this, of this membrane protein, which is pretty cool. And in my experience too, having run this quite a few times, you, all, you get a feeling quickly for how this number might reflect um, what a user might be able to achieve if they more carefully process the data. Again, this is something we don't often or very rarely have time to do, but for publication, you're gonna probably still spend weeks looking at this data set um, and processing it some more. I, my guess would be, for example, this, this structure could probably get down to like 2.5, 2.4 angstroms with a lot of, oh, with extra work. So 
So it's a really good indicator too for the user about what they might be able to expect to get from a data set. Here's a, another example I just picked from the last two weeks, the ribosome. Uh, so large complex, but C1. Uh, I think it's collected over thin carbon because you can see just a lot of CTF contrast. And so the CTF bits go quite high. But again, overall, this is, um, this is very useful information for sort of tuning. And this is, you can see after a little bit of tuning, these numbers and these uh, shifts and trajectories all look really quite nice. And then again, another example, and maybe the angular coverage isn't quite as, as uh, even, but it's still, um, it's, it's okay, right? It's, it's what it needs to be. And you have a 2.7 angstrom map, right? When you stop the data collection, which is a great result. Um, then there's the, the, the points where, where it's very useful to have CrowdSpark live while you're collecting data. This is another example taken from the last uh, two or three weeks. And you can see that um, all of, just trust me, all those other uh, diagnostics were looking really, really nice for this data set. But you know, soon after 2D classification, you start noticing that there's a pretty heavy weighting and really, but what you really wanna see is when you start going into 3D refinement, there's a very strong preferred orientation here. Uh, which manifests and maps as you know these streaks along the uh, the view orientation, and this this really skews the, the the result and makes it kind of unusable in a lot of ways. The FSC resolution is artificially inflated um, because of that bias and so forth. And so in this case, our uh, Spock Nancy Meyer was running CrowdSpark Live um, during this data set being collected saw this preferred orientation pop up in a couple hours, tilted the stage to 45 degrees, which sometimes doesn't work out, but sometimes does. In this case, it did. Um, and you can see after tilting the stage to 45 degrees, again, this patch CTF, beautiful um, sort of diagnostic. It captures accurately that the fact that the, the sample has been tilted. There's much more beam induced motion. This wasn't an ultra foil or anything. So it's not particularly stable at tilt. So the early frames are moving more, but that's, you know, it is what it is. Um, and you could also see there's a lot more variability in the local motion trajectories. Uh, but at the end of the day, you tilt it, those preferred orientations explode outward into these rings. You get a lot better angular um, sort of distribution. Um, so the resolution doesn't really improve very much at all, but the map itself is, is much improved. And I think with a little bit of extra processing about a day or two, I got this one, ended up getting this one down to around 3.1 angstroms. And so it was a pretty quite nice result to pull out of, out of a data set that was started out, um, would have been compromised completely. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to say thank you for everyone. Um, those are sort of the examples of, of some of the th work we've done over the last two years. And I uh, was happy to present some examples of how we use CrowdSpark Live at TNCC. Absolutely, thanks Craig, that was really great. And it was awesome to see those concrete examples I'm sure very illustrative for everyone in the audience, just to get a sense of, of really on a day-to-day -day basis, what kind of decisions can, can actually be made. Uh, that's, that's really exciting and, and very cool. And uh, I think those examples really serve to illustrate just how far single particle cryo-EM has come over not that many years. Um, it wasn't long ago that data collection and cryo-EM and data processing were still totally distinct phases of a project. And, and that was not really by design, it was just necessary because of the constraints of reconstruction algorithms and software tools. And I think we're, we're really excited about the fact that CrySpark Live tries to take a step forward to being able to really optimize data collection and drive insight into that sample quality right at the microscope. And, from our perspective, this is just the beginning. Um, we're looking forward to many developments on the horizon. For example, we think it should be possible to expand the real-time workflow to make that kind of decision-making about grids, squares, holes, and choices of those even easier. Um, we can even foresee a nearly complete automation of first cut data processing, especially in scenarios where similar samples are being repeatedly processed. Um, that should be, be within the scope of what's possible. And, we hope to include even more of the powerful tools that are in CryoSpark into the live workflow, especially to start to investigate heterogeneity in real time. And that, that'll be an exciting frontier. 
Um, so our team is super excited about the positive impact we think real-time processing is going to make on Cryo EM, and, and we hope everyone who's in the audience has a chance and enjoys to use CryoSpark Live uh, going forward. And thanks again to all of our presenters in the audience for listening so far. We're going to move to questions uh, right now. And um, if anyone does have questions, please answer, please ask those in the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, there's also a feedback survey at the end of the webinar, so it'd be great if you can fill that out. Awesome. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, we actually have a lot of questions that have come in, so we'll try and address at least a few of them. And if we don't happen to get to something, feel free to email us, info at structura.bio, and we can always pass along your questions to the appropriate panelists as well. Um, so first up for Giovanna, you mentioned that you also use CarSpark Live on negative stain samples. Can you talk us through if you make any adjustments to parameters specifically for the negative stain workflow? Uh, no, there is a very useful button that says negative staining <laughs> right on the, on the main page. And that's basically, I make sure that I, I use that so that it understands the white over black and black over white. Uh, but other than that, no, I treat it like a straight uh, uh, CryoSpark run without any, any major difference. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, a question for Craig. So in the context of a large facility, and you mentioned that you've got about 16 GPUs and you know, we're, we're all always wishing that we had more, but can you walk us through um, your typical setup? How many GPUs do you normally allocate to, let's say an overnight or a 24 hour data collection run? A lot of people have questions about how many they need when it comes to larger data sets and those are ever, ever getting larger. So any comments you have on that? Yeah, we, we try to get by with three to four per per run GPUs. I, I will say like if you're collecting super resolution in the K3 and you're in the 400 images per hour range, 300 plus 400, you, you might want more um, GPUs. Um, and we, we, our plan has been, and we're very close to having it be real, is to have eight GPUs per microscope because I know you guys, the team at Structura, there's, there's more that's always coming, right? Like um, I see another question later on about classification, a three streaming 3D classification. There's like so many things that we wanna be ready for. Um, uh, I, ideally, I could imagine like, um, wanna be able to have enough GPUs, so eight, so that you can do multiple 3D refinements per um, data collection run, if such as if the sample supports it. Awesome, thanks. Amazing. Um, a question for our team. Um, so there's um, some questions about how the actual streaming 2D classification algorithm in CryoSpark Live works, such that you don't need to restart it as new particles come in. So maybe Ali can take that one. For sure. Yeah. So. 2D classification, um, the typical way it's formulated mathematically is using an expectation maximization framework. And kind of the core assumption there is that you have access to all the data and that every iteration of 2D classification, for example, or 3D classification refinement, they all kind of look the same under the hood. You have to look at every particle in the data set, update its latent variables, which are its pose and class assignment, and then use that to in improve the 3D or 2D classes that you're recovering at that moment. So CryoSpark Live's uh, change in streaming 2D classification is to cut up that algorithm, algorithm into pieces that where we can turn it into an online version of expectation maximization that breaks the assumption that you actually have to update all particles to be able to improve the result. And so what we're able to do in streaming 2D classification is to see as many particles as there currently are at the beginning. In fact, we don't even have to see all of them. Use that to generate 2D classes to explore the sort of space of different uh, objects that may be in the sample or views or confirmations and then continue to stream through the rest of the data set while incrementally updating the 2D classes and the assignment of all past particles. That means that as collection goes on and new particles arrive, the new particles are immediately classified into the classes that are present. Those classes are also incrementally improved as the new particles come in and periodically all the past particles are reclassified to make sure that if there are any changes in terms of viewing directions or et cetera, that every particle belongs to the correct class. Hopefully that's... Uh, Clear. There's also a special case where if particles are removed from the stream, like if somebody uh, starts to reject a bunch of micrographs that were previously accepted based on their thresholds, 2D classification also has to take that into account in a particular way to make sure that information from those particles isn't contaminating the 2D classes when those particles should not be in consideration. Thanks. Um, once we've actually done some live processing, uh, 
a lot of times there's interest in taking those results and then export, exporting them into CryoSpark or into another CryoSpark instance or into another program. Um, Stefan, can you walk us through the interoperability aspect between CryoSpark and CryoSpark Live? Yeah, for sure. So by default, all jobs that run in CryoSpark Live are regular CryoSpark jobs. So if you just switch over to the session, you can actually see a tree view of all the different jobs that were connected. And so even just based on that, you can connect jobs, connect those jobs, those outputs to other jobs right from the CryoSpark interface. But at the end of your live session, there's also two actions that you could do to export all your exposures and all your particles. And that will split up into accepted, rejected, manually rejected, and it will have all the different result slots that were computed by CryoSpark Live. So motion correction, CTF parameters, the PICs, um, the alignments 2D, et cetera. Uh, so you have all that information all available after your session and during your session, and you can always continue processing whenever you want. It's Great, worth noting also that the, the export action doesn't actually involve any copying or transfer of data. Uh, it's just part of the way that the CryoSpark Live and CryoSpark sort of uh, databases are set up that exporting allows CryoSpark to easily use all the outputs of CryoSpark Live, but they don't actually have to be copied or transferred and you don't have to use up any extra additional disk space for those exports. Perfect. Um, a sort of related question, both for Giovanna and Craig, in your context where you're first using CryoSpark Live, is it easy or how do you export that information to your clients or users who may be using their own infrastructure? Um, so I'll go first. Uh, it, we don't, we only give the client the uh, initial data. So we don't transport, we don't out, output any of the processing that we do, we do in house. Um, we can talk with them and, and you know, help them and, and, and describe to them what we've done, but we have not, we do not uh, directly provide them with the results of the output or anything of the, the refinement that we do or we do. There was that the question? Sorry? Was that the question? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Craig, do you have any other sort of workflow tips on in that regard? Yeah, our, our, you know, our scientific points of contact, our Spocks just stay in communication with their users. And if they have a CloudSpark Live run going and it's producing something useful, they'll share those results with them. Um, my eventual end goal is to have CryoSpark itself be directly accessible to users over the internet. Uh, I think we're just trying to sort out some, some um, security concerns maybe with trying to figure out how to do that securely. But that's, that's I think, the real where the real um, value of the web interface comes in. And, and that would be our goal, I think. Great. Um, I know we're a little bit over time. Perhaps we'll just have one or two more questions and then we can, we're can. we happy to answer more via email as well. Um, so next up is sort of more a workflow question. Uh, maybe Soho can take this one. Um, is it possible to feed optimized 2D classes from 2D classification as new templates in particle picking in CryoSpark Live? Hi, thanks for the question. Yes, definitely. Uh, you can import uh, um, templates from any CryoSpark project or job. Um, and it's also possible to use existing manual picks that you've done in the session or even blob or template picks in order to reclassify um, to generate these 2D class classes and use those in turn for the template picker. So it's a very cyclical process. Perfect, thanks. Um, one more question, and this is sort of on uh, hitting a couple of sort of feature roadmap questions. So one is around heterogeneity. Um, so how does CarSpark Live deal with heterogeneity when it comes to ab initio reconstruction and refinement? And also um, with, regard, with respect to particle picking. So do we have any plans to integrate deep pickers into CarSpark Live? Ali, do you want to take this one? For sure, yeah. I think um, heterogeneity is definitely an interesting area where we're interested to expand what we can do in real time. Of course, the computational resource requirements and kind of the uh, logistics around as you add more and more computation that has to be done in real time, things get complicated, but we're working on that. Right now, what you can do in CryoSpark Live is actually run ab initio reconstruction with multiple classes. So your CryoSpark Live session will actually solve multiple different structures um, during ab initio reconstruction. And then you can pick one of those as the initial model for refinement. However, currently all particles that pass the 2D classification stage 
will move forward to 3D refinement, regardless of which class they may have belonged to in ab initio reconstruction. And that's because ab initio reconstruction is not streaming. It just runs once until it converges to some discrete classes and it's done. It doesn't look at new particles at that point. So this is something that we're trying to improve. Uh, the reason we've built it that way is because many times, if you do have a highly heterogeneous, heterogeneous data set or lots of junk, you need to run ab initio reconstruction with multiple classes to get one of the classes to converge to a good initial model of your structure. Um, so right now you can deal, you can at least deal with heterogeneity to that extent. However, the expectation is that once you're done live processing or even in tandem, you could be running heterogeneous refinement or other multi-class ab initio reconstructions in CryoSpark itself during or after that point. Um, likewise with particle picking, that's actually an area that we are very much interested in improving within CryoSpark Live. There have been many recent developments in uh, using deep networks for particle picking. We actually in CryoSpark have our own deep network as well that we created um, that you can train and then uh, use for picking and extraction. You can also save the models and use them repeatedly on other uh, data collection uh, sessions. Right now, CryoSpark Live doesn't include deep picking, but that's something we're planning to implement in the near future. Um, so that should uh, improve particle picking and make it even easier to get a session going. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, I think we're sufficiently over time at this point, and we should probably let everyone <laughs> go to their busy cryorium lives. Thank you so much to all of the attendees and especially our panelists, especially our guest speakers, Giovanna and Craig. Thank you so much for your time and for being here and um, have a great rest of the day. Uh, a recording will be shared afterwards, as well as a feedback survey that Ali mentioned. We'd really appreciate if you can take the time to fill that out. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.